Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Families Embracing Diversity podcast. Today, we are here with Sheen, who vlogs over at Nanani World, and she is here to tell us all about her life, embracing diversity alongside her family and her kids. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, everyone. So could you start off by telling us a little bit about about your story, about where you grew up, how you ended up where you're at today? No problems. Um, my name is Shane. I'm originally from Taiwan. Um, I actually left Taiwan at age around 11. I have been to Singapore, Hawaii, Boston, New York. So I, I actually grew up under multiple influence. And my, my family actually is a very traditional family coming from Taiwan. And you know, Singapore, it's more like a mixture British Asian systems. And later when I moved to the US, it's more like a USA system. So I feel like I'm a third culture kid. And my husband, Daniel, is Brazilian and his grandparents are originally from, from Catalan, Spain. And when he was growing up, um, his grandparents always talk about Catalan, their story, infused the culture, the food, the music. So even when we're dating, he's always telling me about what his grandparents says. He's very proud about this part of his, his family. So, and also even now my mother-in-law is always celebrating Catalonia culture with us on the phone. She's always telling us the story about here. So, so it's, it's just very fun part of the, about the family now. So, and me and my husband, we met in Boston for a very brief period of the time. And we, we kind of go separate way because we were students at that time. And then eight years later, we met again in Brazil and we start dating. So, I moved to Sao Paulo first for him for a few years, and then he actually moved to Taiwan for me. So we have been actually living in Taiwan for the last six years. So um, finally we got married, and now we have two beautiful daughters. Their names are Luana and Maya, and they were born in Hawaii. So we were really all over the place. And you can imagine that Daniel and I were like from two different countries. We grew up from two different places. So we have two different mindsets and two communication styles. So I'm more like get to the point. And he's like a very Latino, likes to tell you the whole story and very a lot of hand gesture. So that's him, okay? And I'm very tense and disciplinary. You gotta do this. I think this is very Asian style. But he's Brazilian, laid back and said, don't worry, it's okay, it's okay. Like she's, he's more like this. So, but you know, after our kids were born and we started to think like how to establish and balance our family culture, our family values, because at the time, we were living in Tainan, which is very traditional. And so everything we do is very um, Asian related. So it's very um, not us. So we started searching where is more suitable for us. And, and we wanted to um, set up our parenting goal and embrace multicultural, our, our multicultural status. So that's how we, we end up in Barcelona to, to restart our life. What made you choose Barcelona? What made you choose Spain? Barcelona, actually, um, when my husband and I, when I was pregnant, we already talked about moving out of Tainan City for many, many times, especially after our kids were born. And so we started to take this more seriously because um, it's us, you know, it's not just me and him anymore. So um, just this year, around uh, last year's spring, we came to Barcelona to visit some of, of our family members. And we really enjoy our time here. I know, I know it feels like vacationing and moving are two different things. I get it. But um, it's, it's good that I was there. I was able to do some research, ask things around, to look everything what I needed to do to, to, to understand. And I understand that Barcelona is a multicultural city. I have been here before and they promote gender equality. It's a very children friendly city and they offers many international school, which is this approach alone is very aligned to what my husband and I really wanted to raise our kids, which is really embrace um, cultural, really embrace multicultural. So um, another thing is, 
uh, Taiwan, I mean, Barcelona located in between Barcelona and Taiwan. So it feels like we are somewhere in between our both side of, of our family. Because, you know, for Brazilian flyover to Taiwan is 36 hours. Right. So it's a very long journey. So we wanted to balance between how we spend time with both sides of the family. So Barcelona was one of the choices. And of course, when you move to a new place, you, ha you, you have family members and friends here. So it's always a good idea to start with you. You, you don't feel you're alone that much. And another reality is, of course, um, he's also a Spanish citizen. So we don't need to worry too much about the visa. Can we live in this place under what kind of stress? Which is really important because until now, I still have not received my residential permit, which is already six months later. So somebody in the house will have to work. Right. So, so <laughs> this is really the more reality side of our, our decisions. But at the end of the day, I think everything was aligned to what our goal is and we love the place. And it's really our dreams to come here. Everywhere you go, there's a pros and cons. There's no perfect place to go. And uh, of course, everybody loves Barcelona. It's a beautiful, multicultural city, but you're gonna come in and deal with a lot of things. So, um, so at the end, it's more like my gut feeling saying that we really need to take the chance and we need to take this risk and we feel right and let's go for it. So that's how we end up in Barcelona. That's good. That's good. And has it been the the restart that you were looking for? Or the it has been great. It's been um, six months now since uh, we arrived here. And like I mentioned just now, I'm still working on my residential permit, which is very normal to take six yeah. months or more than that to get it. So that's true. Uh, we, were, we were expected that to happen. But other than that, um, we do spend around three to four months to do some adjustments from a more Asian countries to, to European countries, of course. So for example, like a food change, um, the way how we commute, we have no car now, we used to drive and we have to take public transportation. So when you think about it, the first thing is grocery shopping. It just became right. a first thing. You need to plan for your grocery shopping. So this is already the first thing. So um, every, but, uh, we're taking bus, we're taking the metro, but the kids, the kids love it because um, when we first arrive, uh, it's very rare for kids to take the bus. So yeah. they're, very happy, they're very happy to take the bus. So on the weekend, we actually needed to have this bus tour just to hop on the bus and then probably a few stops and then we change to come back. They, they love it. So this is a slight adjustment, but... Um, as for kids, I think for the first phase was the most difficult part. It was a little bit bumpy because um, they were not eating, the food were changing, the taste mm -hmm. would change. So they, they basically lost, lost their appetite, um, which is we, we had to take them to the doctor because they were eating snack. They were only choosing the food that they want to. So right. in the end, we have to take them to doctor. And doctor says it's really common, it takes time. And don't present just rice. Rice has many different kind of ways to present the rice. You gotta have to be creative and um, have a little for five if they don't wanna take it away. You know, do this kind of thing. And over time, they, they, they do change their behavior. And during the first couple of months, they cry a lot because they, I think they just moved to a new place um, and they get sick a lot, a lot. And one of the biggest adjustments that I, even myself uh, as a mother, felt really challenging to get through it is when they first get to new school. Um, my older daughter was not talking because she, she was at the Mandarin nursery school. Mm -hmm. And then we switch over to English based international school, even though the family is speaking English, but for her, she was in the Mandarin environment. But anyway, so uh, she didn't talk to anybody, engage with anybody besides the teacher for about three to four months. Mm -hmm. And then um, that was really hard because I have to talk to the teacher and then she was not eating too. So, um, and then the younger one took her sometimes to leave the teacher's body. She always wanted to be whole. She always wanted to be um, next to the teacher. 
So that was really tough for the very first three, four months. But now they're very happy here. They're very excited to go to school. They wake up every day, get ready to, to go to school. We arrange play dates. We're we happy. And I'm just very grateful that everything works out fine and, and I'm very happy with the progress. That's good. That's good. And it is, adjustment is hard for everybody, especially for little kids. So that's one of the downsides that sometimes we don't expect when we're making a big move, but that's good that they've adjusted and that they're, they're enjoying life yeah. there now. I think the most important part for, I know the whole embracing multiculturalism, living in the dream, but when it comes to reality, you still have to know that you just need to handle it because you've there's like a risk and return. If you decided to take this move, then there's like a, this big amount of pressure that you needed to take. But I have to say that it's worth it. It's really worth it. Yeah. That's good. That's good. So in, in your family, you have a lot of, I mean, raising kids and marriage is hard anyway, but within your family, you have a lot of different views and different cultural ideas. How do you balance that? How do you balance the, let's do it like this and, oh, it's all okay. <laughs> How do you make that um, work? If we are, if depending on what kind of thing that we are talking about, like for example, if we are talking about the politics or religions, okay? So these are more sensitive subjects. So we have a different approach than uh, other stuff, like for example, how you eat, what you eat. These are, these are different things. But um, to talk about the more sensitive part that um, regardless what kind of thing that we say, we always want to emphasize that you need to accept and respect other people's differences and that, that their right to believe that what they want. And of course, this is at the end of the day when we decide to put them in a multicultural city, expose them, is really hoping for them to expose this much information that they can understand oh everybody is different so i am also different it's okay to be different and and, and i this is what i really want them to understand even if i don't agree with them it's okay you know so and as a parent i always feel like it's it's really my job to help them to analyze and distinguish what's good or bad regardless what happens so um, to set them independent, it's, it's actually the most important things for me. So um, when we talk about two different cultures, my and his, my husband's or politic, politic views or re religions, um, we wanted to give the kids control over to what they want to believe because um, in order to make them to make the right judgment and decision, it requires communications, educations, and ex uh, appropriate exposure. So, so, with all this effort that we're trying to do, ultimately, is we do not want our kids to end up in some extreme religions. So, yeah. uh, yes, and exposure is really, and communication is the key key for this. You know, to make them be open mind when you talk about it. Actually, kids is more open mind to to think about it, to talk about it when they're when they're when they're older i believe in this and we do things like we explain to god without belief we take them to church with grandma if grandma go to church it's an activity we show them my family is very um also religious in taiwan i take them to temple to show them why they're doing this so i want to show them some faith without them inside the faith community so they can understand faith from their own angle so mm -hmm. oh there are people doing this but faith is something very important probably for you to have growing up. You just need to find your own church, you know? Right. So um, this is some, and, and one of the things that we do is we also um, introduce like Christmas. Uh, we, I'm not Catholic, but I love Christmas. We still do this kind of things for our family. So we position ourselves more like this is a family festival traditions. Mm -hmm. Then like, uh, this is a religion, we're gonna do this, this, and Sunday morning when we wake up, we're gonna go to church. We, we, we don't really do this here. So um, at the end of the day, I think what we really want when we are talking about two different cultures is we want them to be uh, open-minded, to be uh, kind, and agree or not agree, it's important to, to view this from this angle, yes. 
How did your extended family, like your parents and your husband's parents, how did they react to that? Was that hard for them to um, have to take that open-minded view or were they pretty accepting? Yes, I think um, one of the challenging, biggest challenging part about being a multicultural family is we always have to, um, just even myself and my husband, we even have to kind of balance ourselves, okay, what to tell them because we are all talking about what to tell our kids but right right we vice versa is oh you need to tell you need to talk to grandpa so this is what i'm telling my kids but of course i need to call grandpa and say grandpa right. please do this. we're gonna try this together uh we're gonna do summer vacation i need to set things up together so um some of the things that they don't really understand why we're doing this, but I, I also need to educate them to say, this is why we needed to be on the FaceTime every week, right. why every summer is important for me to bring them back to Taiwan so they're in a Taiwan Chinese environment, that it's important to go to Brazil. And actually, it's also important for us to communicate with our Brazilian family that please come to see us, you know, like, and talk to us like we we kind of have to be really proactive with, with this approach you know because people sometimes just feel very lazy and say eventually somebody will call somebody will set up something somebody will explain some things so um my husband and i from this approach we have to take a lot of actions to our kids and to our both side of the families mm -hmm. yeah how do you manage language? That's a lot of languages to need to keep in touch. Lots of language. I know. Um, it was also one of my biggest doubt when I was pregnant with my older one. Because when we, when, when people ask, it's like my husband speaks Portuguese, I speak Mandarin. Our common language is uh, English, of course. Mm -hmm. So I only speak Mandarin with my kids. My husband only speaks Portuguese with my kids. And of course, as a family, we're already in English. And at school, they're already speaking English. So uh, this is how, how we do one parents, one language styles mm -hmm. for multi multilingual children. And at first, it was very difficult because we don't understand because it's the first child. We never had an experience before. So right. we always think, oh, why she's not talking and she's not using this language to, to, to say she's not using that language. And so, but eventually it, it come, come to a place. I think we, we actually practice few things at school and then here um, I emphasize a lot of Mandarin to them. I have my grandparents and my parents talk to them in Mandarin. I use TV also. I know TV control, but you know, here is Spain. You have no Mandarin here. So right. you're going to have to be in an environment that has a Mandarin. So, so that's how we, how we push the language in the family, in our that's, house. That's good. And it, it is, that's hard. That's a lot to manage, but yeah, it does see it. Just, it works. Now yeah. my kids are talking. <laughs> right. And they're going to grow up knowing at least three languages. They live in Spain, maybe four. That's, that's yeah, amazing. That's, yes. But you know, it's very common that when they were at the international school, that the, a lot of students I met, they all started with four languages. Mm -hmm. So I think it's common it's a little bit more common here because when people hear foreign language back in my country like taiwan everybody is thinking how can they do this I right just think poor for them i was like no it's not for them it's good for them right exactly <laughs> lucky them right and i think I it is a lot more common in europe because there's so many languages so close together that you kind of have to if you want to be able to communicate with your neighbors That's exactly yeah that's amazing though that's great so as a family what are some of your favorite ways to help i mean besides you mentioned talking to family and you mentioned language and traditions what else do you do to help your children appreciate the differences among people uh in order for my children to appreciate the diversity the people i think the most important things i need to first create awareness to them to, to tell them that this is happening there are many different people so we do a lot of things we we enrich them in many ways for example i send them to multicultural classroom i set up the diverse play dates arrange cultural activities 
We even moved to Barcelona Multicultural City to raise awareness, but my favorite, favorite is always travel. So my husband and I love to travel. I, I was a backpacker before, and he hitchhiked once across the US, once. So as a couple, we've been to many amazing places. We travel a lot, a few times, hike, or whatever. But we slowed down this few years because of the girls and my pregnancy. I just need to slow down. But I really, truly believe travel is definitely one of the best way to expose the culture, learning new things, create awareness for the diversity. So I always, whenever, like I actually start doing that this year, because last year I was still going through some pregnancy and postpartum things. And I started going back to the travel routine this year. So every time when I do this, I'm actually really, really happy because deep down in my heart, I feel like the best way to learn is really through um, exploring, you know, to, to play by explore, um, to travel, to learn. I always feel this is the best way and the fun way to do it. So this is my favorite way. I agree. Definitely the most fun way. Is it different traveling with little girls instead of just traveling with you and your husband? Yes, it's very <laughs> I have to tell you the truth, it's very difficult. Like, yeah, every, I think I, my first flight with my kids are, uh, they're one month old. And that was the easiest flight because oh, yeah. they're one month old. Okay, right. so for that, you have a lot of preparation. You have to prepare yourself, prepare your partner, and then prepare your kids. And then not to mention, you're going to plan the whole trip, the booking reservations and the packing. So, and not to mention the actual flight alone that you, the, the 15 hours flight, how you get away, moving all the suitcases. I think it's a lot of work, but because I have done this for so many times. So deep down in my heart, I already know what I need to pack, what I need to, to do. And basically all the trip is very important to um, parents to tailor to what um, the, the kids' personality is. Mm -hmm. For example, if they like, they have recently, we just went to a very beautiful place called um, La Deval in, in, um, in Spain. So uh, my kids has been talking about train and snowman, and snowman. So actually that, that place is one and a half hours away from here and you need to take train to get there. So we found a place to do this kind of travel. So when I say travel is not like 12 hours, you right. need to go somewhere crazy, but travel can be somewhere around mini adventure walking in the woods. This is what I meant travel. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's very true. You don't have to start with a 15 hour flight. You can start with the neighborhood across the street. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There are always differences all around us. That's very true. How can people find out more about you, your adventures with your kids? Sorry, pardon how, me? How can people find out more about you, your adventures with your kids? Where can they find you? Uh, they can come to nanani.com or follow me on the Nanani World, on Nanani World, or Nanani World on Facebook. I'm sorry. Okay. I no, that's okay. Facebook. That's all right. Okay. And I'll put the links for those in the description so that way people can find you easily. But thank okay. you. Thank you very much for taking your time to talk with us and share a little bit about thank your you. thank experiences. You for your time. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.